any of these groups, these individuals are directed by a firmly entrenched leadership through a maze of politically motivated compromises to an end that is sadly predictable. The indefinite postponement of profound social transformation, the enrichment of the careers of a few bureaucrats, and the permanent disillusionment of a number of intelligent individuals. And then Fidel lost his voice. It was a dramatic moment. More than 50 years of foreign economic domination were to come to an end that historic night. Un ligero revés sin importancia porque se ha ido una voz por un momento pero ahí está él y está la as a revolutionary strategy, Bolshevism is a failure. The signs are everywhere. The democratic worker states are a sham. There is no democracy. There are only workers in the state. Open warfare among state capitalist nations has destroyed the myth of a single correct ideology. Yet the influence of Bolshevism has never been more profound. As a growing social crisis renders liberalism and all of the traditional bourgeois ideologies irrelevant, Liberal thinkers turned to Bolshevism, appropriating some of the milder elements of its program. Gradually, Bolshevism and liberalism merge. This leftist humanism has become the ideology of a whole social stratum raised on the spectacle of revolt, that is, the cadre. The cadre is a reformist of daily life. He takes up Bolshevism's apparently antisocial attitude and values, but without the militant posture. Like the Bolshevik, the cadre is paranoid about authority, anti-imperialist, and easily outraged. But unlike the militant who is willing to sacrifice himself for the party, the cadre does everything with an eye toward the preservation of his social position. Everyone 
because its goals and its methods are truly democratic. The possibility of a new trial for two of Malcolm X's convicted killers when Tony Brown's journal returns. As traditional mandatory forms of social organization, like the family, the corporation, and the state lose their power over the individual, more modern voluntary forms of control appear. Today in the West, updated forms of the Bolshevik party, like the collective, the affinity group, and the commune spread all the basic principles of Bolshevism, while appearing to dispense with rigidity and sterility of the traditional political groups. The individual learns how to give himself up for the glorification of an abstraction. He learns how to reconcile himself to a collectively produced mediocrity. And most important, he learns that this society permits and even encourages his attempts to restructure social life as long as they alter nothing fundamental to the maintenance of the spectacle. A critique of Bolshevism is political only insofar as it is a critique of politics, of separate power, of representation. The way to end politics is not to ignore it, but to suppress it. Though it no longer represents a viable strategy, Bolshevism will remain formidable as long as it can maintain its monopoly on the interpretation of revolution. to sum up what modern society has thought of itself over the last decade, one could say at least this, that the social forces which seemed to be polarized clearly a few years before have undergone a development so complex that one can no longer easily recognize and label individuals according to their relationship to power, and that this development has created a sense of confusion and restlessness in the society as a whole. Here, ideology stops and history begins. It's hard to stay involved in politics. After Vietnam, nothing interests me anymore. May 68 was a really wild time in France. I wish I'd been there to march with the workers. Paris is great. What this town needs is a cafe where you can meet and talk with interesting people. stratum in the traditional class structure was the petty bourgeoisie, who, representing a primitive social system based on local autonomy, longed for the simplicity of an earlier period, but always sided with power in the end. The transitional figure in the post-World War II universe of the modern spectacle is the cadre. The cadre is the answer to the question, where have all the radicals gone? The cadre is the institutionalization of the two-sided and contradictory nature of the spectacle, which simultaneously sings its own praise and smelling its own stench reports it. The cadre is not the managerial class, nor the white collar worker, nor the hip professional. The cadre is anyone willing to perform his or her role in exchange for the miserable compensations which modernity confers. The cadre is the center of the fabled post-war revolution in the world of the commodity. It is for him that the latest cultural innovations are created. He lives in the new architecture, goes to the modern cinema, pursues the current dream of liberated sexuality. He is the person who acts out eulogies of the commodity society and believes them, who writes pseudo-critiques of the commodity society and believes them, who finds the world unlivable and still manages to flourish in it. The cadre must appear to be in the vanguard of his epic, he must be in favor of everything progressive, everything radical, everything that purports to be new and innovative and stylish. He 
He is the modern consumer who hates what he must consume because he knows all of its inadequacies, and yet who continues to search for the perfect commodity, the one which contains no imperfection. He believes that his educated refusal of inadequate commodities place him above the obedient consumer who believes what he is told. The cadre simultaneously wants to enjoy the security of submission and the thrill of refusal. The goal of the spectacle is to make each individual its accomplice by the whole of his life and aspirations. The spectacle is made to be lived by its spectators. The cadre is well suited to the fantastic vision of a world where there is no visible interference in the lives of individuals. The cadre sees himself as an exemplary individual who can live without police because he polices himself. He never tires of broadcasting that fact to a world he finds barbaric. The cadre believes in reform, reform of every aspect of daily life, piece by piece. He leads the movement to remodel the spectacle. He reforms his consciousness with drugs and therapy. He reforms the workplace by participating in the decision-making processes of large businesses, by creating collectives and cooperatives, by establishing alternative trade unions. He reforms consumption by ferreting out dirty commodities, the nasty processes, the unsafe regulations. The cadre believes in reform most of all because, for all this talk about revolution, he is terrified of having to give up the security of this world, where he enjoys certain ordinary privileges, for a world where he could become anything, a villain, a hero, or simply a mediocre man. The cadre wants the impossible dream of the spectacle, to consume without working. If he admits that he works, it is only to add that he is doing something that he likes to do, which makes him different from everybody else. I got it the last time I was in China. The habits and interests of the cadre are gradually becoming the habits and interests of workers and consumers as a whole. The cadre appears everywhere, exhorting us to forget what we do all week in order to better enjoy the weekend, or to search for possibilities for intelligent activity within the confines of the spectacle. One measure of the success of the cadre as a role model is a growing sentiment of workers in general to think of themselves as better off than others. Everyone else is unhappy. Westerners think that Eastern Europeans are really miserable. Northern Italians feel sorry for the peasants of the South. Factory workers can understand the strikes in the coal mines. Alcoholics pity heroin addicts. in a lot of ways you're a model for me. It's so much easier to look at your life than to think about mine. So easy. I just think of something that I like to do and then the rest takes care of itself. I dream of a world outside of this one. A simpler, gentle place which is us and the children. A world without men doesn't bother me. In fact, I welcome it a bit. The intellectual is a cadre who is most proud that he works who wants his work to be visible. The intellectual wants the world to know that his activity, the production of ideology, is work, just like making cars. In fact, the intellectual goes one step further. If many workers play down what they do 40 hours a week, the intellectual steps forward as a representative of the proletariat. The more that silence surrounds the worker in his alienation, the more the intellectual feels obliged to provide meaningful social commentaries. The intellectual is a spectator who can't bear to simply stand and watch the spectacle with his hands in his pockets. He has to write something down. It must be obvious from all this that the existence of the cadre could never have been discovered by leftism or by other brands of modernist ideology because the leftists and the modernists are cadres themselves. Instead, he manufactures special vocabularies and new sciences to explain his impotence, posing 100 times as many questions as he answers. The bourgeoisie know that they will get nothing practical from this modern-day eunuch, but they also know they are not capable of solving